Funny little things these. Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today we're going to talk about this, the Gribbs Hunden crossbow. We're also going to range across a few other areas because it's an interesting project, not just about crossbows, but about the way that you approach reproduction artifacts and what they do and how they work. Now we're going to start at the beginning. So my knowledge of history is English based, France, Italy, Germany, um, but not so much going up towards Scandinavia. So Gribbs Hunden, we'll start at the beginning. King John of Denmark um, and uh, Sweden liked to fight quite a lot. And this is talking about the late 15th century. King John had a ship called the Gribshunden, or in English, the, the Griffin. Now, he went off raiding in 1495. Ship caught fire, sunk in sh shallow waters off the uh, Blekinga archipelago in southern Sweden. Sorry if I've messed the pronunciation up. 1970s, a bunch of Swedish divers, um, local diving club, found the wreck. And then since then, there's obviously been investigation and so on. But 2019, I believe there's been quite a, a larger upscale investigation, archaeological work on the site. And this has been done by a few universities, funded through Lund University and Blair Kingham Museum. And they've asked for me to make a reproduction of a crossbow that they have found, or fragments of a crossbow. And that is really where the story begins. Now, if you have a look at uh, these pictures here, these are fragments of a crossbow stock. There's not a lot to see. You can see where the nut was. You can see a couple of holes, trigger hole, a pin hole for some other purpose. Um, there's not really a, a great deal of it left. They wanted me to interpret that and turn it into a crossbow as it could have been that they were then able to shoot and test, really. So we looked at some of the artwork around the time. So these are the sort of pictures we were looking at. That gives you a bit of a layout. We looked at another Danish crossbow or a crossbow in a Danish museum that again gives you uh, the sort of thing that we're talking about, that we're looking at here. It was a very interesting project, this, because I'm being dictated to about how to make a dynamic, a kinetic object. Now, you might think that they're the client, I'm the, I'm the supplier, I make what they tell me. Yes and no, because at the beginning, and this is no disrespect to to, to them, but they didn't quite understand the complexities of making a crossbow using the information they had. So they knew that they had a nut that they had found, which was on the shipwreck, but not necessarily or any evidence at all. It was associated to the stock they had, but they wanted the nut of this size and they wanted the stock, the crossbow based on that stock. And then they had bolts here, which are based on bolt shafts that they found that they wanted to shoot from the bow. But we don't know the width of the bow, we don't know the draw length, we don't know the power stroke. None of that is left on the stock that exists. Now we're just going to have a look at the bolts here. Now this bolt here is uh, one of my standard kind of bolts, but it's a bit shorter than I would usually do, by about 50, 60 mil, two inches or so. This makes it less stable in flight, makes it harder to use, harder to make. The bolts that they found on the wreck may or may not have been associated with that particular crossbow we'll never know. But they wanted to be able to say, these were the bolts that we found. Again, I can say that this is a bolt that will shoot from that bow, but it's not that it was necessarily the bolt for that bow. And actually, I suspect it's probably for a lighter bow because it is a bit shorter and short, lighter bows are happier with shorter bolts. Then we come to this one, which is really curious. Now, of course, in the modern day and age, you don't take your hunting weapons with you um, when you go on campaign as a soldier. Things were different then. And this is a hunting bolt. It's blunt headed. It is to protect the plumage or the fur when you're hunting. It's to not to penetrate. It's to bludgeon something to death. It has a three quarter inch and 18 mil diameter shaft here and then tapering down. But this again is part of the problem. So they had some bolts where they, the actual groove for the flights was very indistinct and I couldn't really make it out. So I just had to assume that it was wooden flight. It might have been feathered. Um, and I put my wooden flights on. It had a very pointed 18 mil, three quarter inch shaft here with a very pointed point for the socket. We didn't have any heads. I have to assume that it was a crown bolt, a hunting head, uh, even though it's a military ship. You know, they, they land, they shoot. And the shaft length was really short. I think it was about 22 centimeters, something like that. A very difficult thing. I, I've never made one like that. I thought that the thing would never work in a million years. I shot it, it didn't work, it was hideous. 
And then I cut the flights down because my intuition was telling me that there was too much drag at the back. I cut the flights down and it shoots nice and clean. So that was quite an interesting thing for me. But the other thing that was interesting is that you can see at the end just here, all right, just at the end there, it's curved to, to sort of cup the string. I don't know if it was necessary for this type of bolt to do that. It's not something I've ever seen in a crossbow bolt before, but it was evident on the bolts that were found on, on the um, Gripsund there. So what they were asking me to do was to make a working crossbow so they could use it and shoot it and test it and display it and say this is the sort of bow that they had. I can't do that. I can't do that because there's not enough left of the bow and bows are not, they weren't made to a pattern, you know, different makers made them in different ways. So that's not something I was able to do. But the other thing that I'm not able to do is say yes of course I can make the nut that size and yes of course I can make the nut this far back from the socket because by doing that I paint myself into a corner and that corner might not necessarily deliver a bow that works and of course the client wants a bow that works so we had quite a lot of toing and froing saying do you want one that looks like that or do you want one that works or do you want one that kind of looks like that and works or you know and this is the thing it's difficult now we, i'm going to explain what i mean by that so we're going to start at the bottom line right you make a reproduction of a dagger now this dagger here it needs to fit my hand. Well, that's fairly obvious. The blade needs to be the right kind of length. Well, again, that's fairly obvious. It's the right kind of th thickness. Now, point of balance, it, it, it's a personal thing. My view will be different to your view. So there's no right or wrong about this. As long as it is the right kind of dimensions and the right kind of materials and the right kind of um, shape and, and appearance, then it is basically the right dagger. It's a fairly static object. You can't go too far wrong reproducing something like that. You take this sword here. This one's actually by Albion. The, the dagger there was Todd Cutler. Uh, this is an Albion sword I happen to have. This is slightly different. Now, if you look at this, a, a sword is a spring. Now, you can see it wobble, I hope. Now, here you've got a centre of percussion. That's where you want to strike with your sword. My personal view is that might be perfect. You might not like that. You might want that position here or here. So, again, if I reproduce a sword like this, it's, if that point of percussion is slightly different or the balance point here is slightly different by a centimetre or so, it doesn't matter. It's still a good sword. It might not be your sword, but it might be my sword. It's still a good sword. A sword is harder to make than a dagger because it has some kinetic properties, but it is a still essentially a fairly straightforward object to get a good sword, right? There are some things you have to do, but this is where it all changes. Because you take a bow like this, and as soon as the client starts to dictate to me what these dimensions should be, the possibility of this bow working, it just goes through the floor. It might work, but it might not. And I can't deliver a bow that doesn't work. Let's look at the bow from the front to the back. So we have a stirrup here, which is different to the one in the museum, on the museum bow, but is in line with the artwork of the time that is geographically correct. We've got a steel bow here, the original was probably composite, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, however, steel was certainly around, so it's a plausible possibility. I don't make composites. Linen string, uh, hemp bindings to hold the bow on. Then we've got a holly stock here. I don't know if any analysis has been done on the wood, um, but it's a nice, dense, hard wood, so it's well suited. Horn cheek plates here. Uh, those are required to strengthen the sides of the stock. Now, uh, the Danish bow had a steel band here which held the the pin going through and a steel band here I've forgotten the German name for this but it's instead of cordage um, where the nut is tied on they put the steel through sometimes then we have an antler nut here with uh, a steel sear and then the reinforcement pins that go through the teeth and then we come to the pin here now if this was a Kranequin bow and I would expect this sort of bow to be a Kranequin bow I would also expect this pin to be a bit further back. If it was loaded by a goat's foot lever, I'd expect it to be a little bit further forward. So it's, it's a little bit in sort of a no man's land between the two. I've made it as a goat's foot one because we had some time issues and, and some budget issues. And it works as a goat's foot lever, but it's, it's not ideal. But again, it, it highlights that thing about certain aspects of a bow. If, if, they, if they are defined, then you have to follow them. And that hole was clearly there on the stock and its relationship to the nut was clearly there in the trigger hole. So really those relationships were set. So I wanted to follow that. It's what, it, 
it's the tiniest little bit of information that we could really extract out of that stock. That and the fact that it was the curvy type of, of bow like this one here, sort of um, either a hunting bow or a war bow. There wasn't a lot of def uh, differentiation, but it was of that sort of central and northern European curvy style. And then we have a trigger bar that again is following the ones in the paintings, more or less. This goat's foot lever, it's made from scratch, it's made for some less than ideal hole positions, and so it doesn't work quite so well. But there are other ways you can do it, and I'll show you that now. Let's see it shoot. So the first thing, set the nut into the open position. Goat's foot lever on, a little different to my regular ones now. Just putting a bit of pretension on it, flipping the bow upside down. You see this in Italian manuscripts quite a lot. Pushing with the bow and the lever, up and in, and then we're off. So a regular bolt this time, first up. So a couple of inches above the center, set the nut again. This time we'll shoot a crown bolt. Yep. A little bit of pretension, there we are. And we're in. Funny little things these. Gonna shoot a bit low. And there we are. So you can see it shoots well enough and you certainly wouldn't wanna get hit by that. And there you are. You've seen the bow shoot the crown bolts, you've seen it shoot the armor piercing bolts. And you know, it, it, it shoots well, it's, it's a good performing bow. But it was a very interesting project for me because more than any other project that I've done recently, this has highlighted what the client wants and what the supplier wants. And the supplier does not always want to give what the client wants. And in honesty, the client doesn't always want to receive what they've asked for. And the crossbow highlights that, that it's a complicated mechanical device. It's, it's, it's kinetic, it's got lots of moving parts. It does certain things. There's a relationship between every single element there that is important. And you cannot cherry pick and say, I want this, this, and this, and I want you to make a bow that works. It's not like that. And it was a lovely meeting of coming together and understanding what uh, London University and Blair Kingham Museum wanted and what I was prepared to do and deliver. Because as a client, you may well say, this is what I want. But actually, if what you want doesn't function, it's not going to take you very long after you've received it to decide it's not what you wanted at all. And then suddenly it becomes my fault. So it's really a supplier's duty as well to hold the hand of the, of the person commissioning it, walk you through the process and end up with an item that might not be exactly what you started with, but is exactly what you wanted. And there we are. So the uh, Gribshunden crossbow project. Really interesting one for me. Thank you.